the battle for Marawi, the Philippine army is still struggling to recapture this southern city from fighters linked to ISIL. So how serious is the threat of armed groups in this region? And can it be contained? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Hazem Sika. Welcome to the program. The Philippine government says it will be relentless in its fight against armed groups in the southern city of Marawi. After an eight-hour truce put in place to allow people to celebrate the end of Ramadan, an air and ground offensive has resumed to push hundreds of ISIL-linked fighters from the city who had taken control of the area last month. And since the operation began, more than 350 people have been killed, with at least 300,000 people forced to leave their homes. Jamila Alindogan has this update from Marawi. They are hoping to get a glance of the moon, a sign that the end of the holy month of Ramadan is over. Eid has come, they tell me, but unlike previous years, this one is met with sadness. It is painful for us to see this situation. Our prayers are deeper, more fervent. Thousands of civilians are celebrating Eid in evacuation centers like this one. Despite the uncertainty, parents try to create a semblance of normalcy for their children. Ramadan was felt deeply here. It has been a difficult month. The siege in Marawi continues as state forces battle it out against an ISIL-inspired group called the Maute. The group wanted to set up an Islamic state in Lano province and took control of several parts of Marawi city. 200 people have died so far and hundreds of civilians are believed to be trapped in the fighting. As a gesture of goodwill, the Philippine military declares a humanitarian ceasefire. From 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. here, the military offensive was halted to give the faithful a respite from the violence. For the first time in weeks, sermons were not drowned out by gunshots, and people here are grateful. It is the quietest Marawi has been. There is a time to contemplate, they say, a time to weep. The best of the military hardware is already here. Aerial bombardments are relentless, and the government refuses to commit to a date to end the siege. The displaced continue to pray for the lives that have been lost and for the uncertainty over their future. There was no time for quiet reflection, they say, because Ramadan came at a time of war. Jamal Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Marawi City, Southern Philippines. Well, the southern Philippines has a long history of conflict with Muslim armed groups. Most of the fighting in the south is in the remote islands of Mindanao. Three main groups are active in the area, including the Moro National Liberation Front, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, and the Abu Sayyaf group. And one of the largest rebel groups, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, was formed in 1978 to fight for a separate Islamic state in Mindanao. After decades of conflict, the group signed a peace deal with the government in 2014, bringing an end to one of the world's longest conflicts. Last year, a former member of Abu Sayyaf, Isnilon Hapilon, was believed to have pledged his allegiance to ISIL, becoming a leader of the group in the Philippines. And last month, President Rodrigo Duterte declared martial law in Mindanao after ISIL-linked fighters took over Marawi City. We'll talk to our guests in a moment, but first let's go to Mr. Jose Custodio. He is the former Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and a former consultant at the Philippine National Security Advisors Office. He joins me via Skype now uh, from Manila. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, so since this operation began in, in late May, at least 350 people have been killed, at least 300,000 forced to flee their homes. How do you respond to those who say that... Uh, the military has underestimated the enemy and made the situation far worse for the people living there. Well, the thing is that it was an urban area that they attacked, okay, and urban 
uh, battles are the most complicated type of military operations because you have to contend with um, the civilians. At the same time, you have to contend with strongly built buildings, okay, where uh, snipers or whatever assistance can be inside and slowing down to slow down the military's advance, okay? So it's very complicated. It's not as simple as keyboard warriors would like or critics would like to it to, to appear to be, okay? So and, uh, we must also remember that the Philippine military is a military that is uh, heavily committed to um, rules of engagement and rules of war, okay? Uh, it's not like uh, other militaries that face with such a situation, they will just bombard the entire area of kingdom come, okay? In the case of the Philippine military, yeah, as much as possible, it wants to avoid um, uh, collateral damage or casualties in its operations. And also the, the fact that the gunmen are um, also um, uh, using um, human shields or hostages also have hostages and that also has a has the ability to slow down the tempo of operations of the philippine military well you say that um uh, the, the military doesn't have plans to 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 bomb the place to kingdom come as you call it but the president duterte yeah. has said that he would order uh, carpet bombing in his words if if it was needed to end this uh, and he said well, uh, you don't invade it with men you really crush it with bombs if i have to flatten flatten the place i will do it so uh, and obviously the military take orders from him. Is that a possibility? And what's that going to lead to? Basically, the president here has a very colorful way of saying things, okay? So it's usually like that. Uh, but the military, um, the, um, like I said, it adheres to rules of engagement, okay? Um, and uh, rules of war, okay? So you will see the same... Um, cautious manner in which it advances, in which it uh, undertakes this very complicated urban battle. And, you know, in any country, any military, for that matter, okay, for, for example, in Iraq, where you have, uh, you have Mosul or Fallujah during the time of the American invasion, that it took the Americans such a long time before they were finally able to quell whatever the resistance of the Fedayeen were in uh, uh, the resistance of the Mujahideen in, uh, in Fallujah. So, like I said, uh, Urban battles are very complicated. If you employ um, uh, overwhelming force, too much overwhelming force, you end up alienating the population. In its case. Because remember, it's an inter it's a it's a Philippine city. Uh, you have a lot of civilians there also, and many of them um, will be caught in the crossfire if you have uh, if you have the military indiscriminately cannoning and um, using force, and in, in the and that will actually lead to um, hostility against the AFP, okay? So that's why the AFP is very careful. Who are the fighters who are carrying out this siege? Are they are they Abu Sayyaf? Are they ISIL? Are they are they uh, Mot as, as they're known? What, what are they made up of? Well, that, that's a thing, okay? Because um, internationally, we tend to think, of, uh, the, the international community tends to think of us um, foreign terrorists, ISIL, and what have you. But actually, if you look at the ground, okay, this, are, this is just more complicated than it seems to be. This is not just simply an ISIS type or ISIL type of, uh, uh, of operation. There are so many threads here, like, for example, you even have um, uh, armed groups are linked to uh, politicians who had been defeated in the in the previous election, okay, uh, political rivals, okay, who have, um, who have uh, used uh, this, um, this uh, um, event to, to um, so anarchy and mayhem. Okay, so that's a thing here. There are so many groups here. They're all um, part of a ongoing problem in uh, Mindanao, which is the fact that there are uh, a lot of um, dissent here, mainly f uh, you mainly coming from, for example, the secessionists, as you had mentioned a while ago, and then uh, backlashes to, for example, uh, you have um, reaction also to uh, feudal uh, politics among the uh, Muslim communities here, okay, wherein uh, um, there is discontent from many in the uh, uh, um, lower uh, classes of Muslim society in the way some of their leaders manage their affairs. So that's why you have all of this. It's uh, all of these things happening. It's quite complicated. It's not as simple as it said as it appears to be. Like it's like you have the like the ISIL coming here, and then this is all part of a big caliphate. No, I don't think it's as simple as that. Okay, if it had been as simple as that, then for example, uh, the Al Qaeda, which had come here in two thousand. Uh, uh, or actually earlier than 2000, in the 1990s, by this time there would have been a caliphate there. But no, there are other, there are other drivers to what is going on in Mindanao.
What's the, what's the end game here? Because the longer this goes on, is there not a danger that this is going to act as a pulling ground for more uh, jihadists uh, outside the Philippines as well? Well, the problem is that, okay, a uh, jihadist might want to come to the Philippines, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's point A to point B, okay? This is not the Levant where you have uh, easy uh, uh, access, okay, to many of the states there, okay, because it's just one large landmass. This is an archipelago, okay? Indonesia is an archipelago, Malaysia is an archipelago, so they have to go through a much more difficult process to come here, okay? And that being said, like I said, um, uh, uh, that being said, you have the problem here, for example, of the Maute gunmen and their affiliates in the way they challenge the government, okay? um, fighting the government in a frontal uh, battle. Uh, yes, it pays dividends in you get international recognition, you become notorious internationally, but there's also a problem there because your fighters get... Uh, um, get wasted in frontal engagements. And it's not really very simple. It's not very easy to replace fighters, okay? Especially since some of their leadership is being hit right now, being killed. And in the, in the pattern in the Philippines, um, when the top leadership gets uh, eliminated, the second or the third, uh, leader, the, cer the third layers, it's not that they get, they get more radicalized. You actually get less radicalized people. And then that's when the organization starts losing its direction. Case in point, for example, is the uh, Abu Sayyaf. Okay? It started out as a very fundamentalist organization. But when the top leadership um, uh, were killed off, um, the, the, rest, the successors became um, more involved in uh, kidnap for random type of activities or criminal activities. The same thing may happen, of course, to the Maute group because many of their uh, top leaders are getting killed in this uh, frontal battle uh, with the uh, armed forces. That's why other organization, other rebel groups in the Philippines, they don't do those things. What they do is that they do simple ambushes and try to keep their leadership intact because they know the lesson of if you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Philippine military, you may end up uh, wasting all your uh, valuable cadres, and next thing you know, you you have less qualified or less um, dedicated people in the uh, ranks as replacements. Good to get your perspective on this. Jose Custodio joining us there from Manila. Thanks for being with us. Well, let's bring in our other guests now. Joining us uh, also from Manila via Skype is Richard Haidarian. He is a columnist for the uh, Manila Bulletin. He's also the author of the book, Asia's New Battlefield, The USA, China, and the Struggle for the Western Pacific. In Singapore, we have Graham Ong Webb, research fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies uh, in Singapore. Good to have you both with us, uh, gentlemen. Um, Richard Haidarian, what um, are the implications of all of this for the, the region as a whole, do you think? Well, I mean, just uh, last, uh, I mean, earlier this month, there was the Shangri-La Dialogue, the major security summit here in the Asia-Pacific region. And more than anything else, more than the South China Sea disputes, uh, more than the North Korean uh, uh, threat, the issue of uh, transnational terrorism really dominated the agenda. And you see not only Southeast Asian countries like Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, but you see other countries in the region and beyond, including Australia and the United States, showing tremendous amount of worry about what's happening in this part of the world. Not to mention also other countries like China and Russia. I mean, there were reports that there were possibly Caucasian fighters, Chechenian fighters among the Maute ranks during the Marawi operations. The Chinese are also worried about the possibility of Uyghur or Uyghur fighters also joining the fight there in Mindanao and gaining a tremendous amount of experience that they can use back uh, in their original strongholds there in China or in Russia. So a lot of countries are really worried about what's happening here. I think the perception right now is that Mindanao is the weak link, that the Philippines in general is the weak link in the region. And if there's going to be a distant caliphate, if there's going to be a Wilayat al-Mashret, a Dolat al Islamiyah, uh, you know, kind of branch here in Southeast Asia, it's most likely going to be in Mindanao. I agree with Jose Custodio that perhaps the Mindanao is not as accessible as, say, Levant region. But the fact of the matter is that Mindanao has very porous borders with Malaysia and Indonesia. And the fact of the matter is that these countries have not been very effective in terms of sealing off or properly monitoring and surveying those borders. And that's why it's very easy for foreign fighters, not only from Indonesia or Malaysia, but all the way from Arab countries and the Russian Caucasus to come into the uh, Mindanao and join the fight there in Marawi. So as one analyst put it, unfortunately, Mindanao is becoming the new sexy destination for the international jihadi movement. And as everyone knows, as the Daesh 
gets hammered there in Mosul and increasingly also in Raqqa in the coming months, they're going to look at more and more, re, uh, more and more pivoting to East Asia. So that's the perception. Philippines is a weak link and the Philippine government needs all the help it can get. And that's why you have American special Invo forces involved there. You have the Australians sending spy planes and giving aid to the Philippines. You have possibly even Russian and, and China's Chinese providing intelligence support. Then, of course, last week there was a very crucial meeting uh, between the foreign ministers of Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, whereby they discussed about not only joint patrols to seal off and protect their porous borders, but also to make sure that they have maximum amount of cooperation in terms of intelligence sharing and also fighting against radical uh, uh, Islamist ideology online. So, so there is great sense of urgency right now. Graham Ongweb, what's your take on this? Uh, what's what's the potential uh, in your view for for ISIL and its affiliates to grow and and spread in Southeast Asia? Uh, well, I uh, concur with the assessment by Jose Jose Custado and uh, Richard Hadarian on the the general outlook of the situation. Uh, this is uh, not a trivial matter. Uh, it's still early days um, as we go along in terms of how this is going to pan out. But I think the stakes are pretty high. I think the risks for the spread of uh, the Islamic State's uh, reach across Southeast Asia is uh, quite um, significant, uh, not just in physical terms, but also in terms of how um, potential uh, radicalized groups and individuals across Southeast Asia, those sitting in Indonesia, those sitting in Malaysia, those sitting in Singapore, uh, you know, uh, presumably, uh, are looking to how this thing is going to pan out. And this could lead to uh, further uh, uh, governization, if you like. Uh, so I, I do concur with the assessment that getting to Mindanao is going to be pretty tough. It's quite different, the terrain in Mindanao, compared to the terrain in the Levant. But uh, it's a matter of time and space. Uh, taking into account the porousness of the tri-border area between southern Philippines and East Malaysia and, and the, the adjacent part of Indonesia, it's just a matter of time and space before there will be very um, uh, highly inspired, highly committed uh, individuals who will make their journey towards that theatre of conflict and to contribute to the fight. Uh, Singapore in particular is watching the developments very, very closely over the last few weeks, we've had a series of developments here in, in my country, uh, a series of arrests of individuals who've been radicalized. Uh, we have evidence of that. Uh, they've been taken under custody. Uh, it's a weak signal, but albeit a significant signal, that there are individuals, here in Singapore at least, who are in being inspired by what's going on, not just in the, the core of the fight in the Middle East, in the, the swath of the Levant, but also in, in Mindanao. And uh, if uh, the Maute group uh, is able to hold on uh, and to carry on fighting, it, it might just uh, inspire uh, individuals here either to contribute to the conflict over there or to carry out lone wolf attacks uh, in the key cities here in Southeast Asia, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, in uh, Jakarta and Singapore. So we are, are all uh, watching closely. Richard, uh, we're on the edge of our seats. Uh, Richard Haidarian, when we look at Marawi City specifically, what motivates uh, these fighters to, to take up arms? Is it, is it poverty and, and a kind of political disenfranch disenfranchisement, uh, or is it just simple militant jihad? Well, it's always a combination of factors, right? But remember, Marawi was called the Islamic city of Marawi. It's the largest Muslim majority city in the entire Philippines. And for a large, large uh, you know, period of history, it has been known as a very cosmopolitan, intellectual uh, kind of place. But increasingly, we see the Islamization of the city. And of course, for the, Mar uh, for the Maute group to occupy or at least hold on to such a large city of hundreds of thousands of people for such a long time, it's sending a signal that you can actually be quite effective in trying to get uh, territory here in the Philippines. I mean, it's been already a month and the Philippine government is still struggling to take back certain neighborhoods, uh, certain barangays from them. Uh, so this has, uh, you know, po possibly sent the wrong signal that, you know, that there's, there's a lot of, you know, a right foot uh, for the picking as far as the Philippines is concerned. So Marawi was very symbolic and it's quite a developed city. Of course, now it's unfortunately devastated. So it made a lot of sense for the Maute group to try to attack that. Uh, I mean, uh, so that's one thing. But the, the fact of the matter is that it's not only the Maute group involved here. Uh, you have five different groups who have pledged their allegiance to the ISIS. And they used to be actually competing with each other because they have... They come from different ethnic backgrounds. Some of them are more maritime, some of them are more land-based. 
Um, Maranao, now you have the consolidation of these groups. Isnilon Hapilon, for instance, is from the Abu Sayyaf group, who are more the maritime Tausuk ones. But now Isnilon Hapilon has been working you know, side by side by the Maute brothers for Maranao. Now you have three other groups, the Ansara Khalifa, the Khalifa Islamiyah, and the Bangsamar Islamic Freedom Fighters who are also operational and engaging in terror attacks across other parts of Mindanao. So over right. the coming you know, months and years, you can imagine new waves of attacks as these groups try to not only occupy territory, but also to prove their bona fide. I mean, if anything, the Maoti group went from obscurity to now a leading force as far as the ISIL movement and the radical jihadi right. movements in, in let's Philippines get, and Saudi Asia. Let's get, get uh, uh, Graham's take on this. When, when, when we look at um, the, the, what motivates um, uh, these fighters, how do we compare the situation uh, in Marawi to elsewhere uh, in the region? Is it the same kind of factors that we were just talking about? Essentially, I mean, it's, 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 it's risky for any analyst to overgeneralize the, the trends and the vectors of, um, of terrorism going across Southeast Asia. We have different uh, historical and, and cultural trajectories that differentiate between Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, the Philippines. But uh, there, there are some similarities as well. And I take the points raised by Jose and, and, and Richard uh, about about the, the range of complexity that's involved. Uh, we have several layers, essentially. Uh, I mean, right now we're looking at one veneer, which is essentially articulated in terms of uh, support for the Islamic State, affiliation to the Islamic State. Uh, but beneath that, uh, there's a complex web of, of networks, uh, uh, kinship relations, feudal relations, clans, uh, banditry, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, c criminal organizations um, and uh, terror groups uh, or insurgents, if you like, who have been fighting for uh, political causes, whether it's independence over, because of a, of a differentiated identity on, along religious and ethnic lines and so forth. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole hodgepodge. Um, but uh, right now what we're looking at is um, sort of like a, a meta-narrative that's forming uh, very quickly where um, uh, this, this uh, differentiation between the, the groups that uh, Richard uh, well painted out, Abu Sayyaf and Jama'a Islamia and the Moral uh, Islamic Liberation Front, Front and so forth, are all sort of uh, putting aside these differences um, and uh, sort of joining hands. Uh, so I suppose even leveraging on each other's strengths and, and challenges to uh, put up a, a broad front uh, to take on the respective governments in the region. So right now, we're looking on a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight between the Philippines government and the, the Maute group, uh, which is, again, a conglomeration of different groups as well, so not just the Maute group. But we're going to look uh, at very similar uh, challenges between the respective governments, uh, even the one here in Singapore, where we're looking out very closely for uh, very similar right. trends that may, that may happen uh, across the horizon. R Richard uh, so Hyderian, Yes, it's, um, it's a whole complex web of, um, of uh, networks and factors. Richard Idarian, uh, President Duterte has, has, has talked, about, talked about implementing a federalism uh, in the Philippines, which would give greater autonomy to a region like Mindanao. Um, should he make, make good on that promise? What effect would that have? Uh, what would that mean for, for people there? Would that be a step in the right direction uh, in dealing with these problems? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, I think it's quite unfair to blame President Duterte for what's happening in Marawi. I mean, to a certain degree, yes, he paid a lot of attention to his war on drugs, uh, peace negotiations with the communist rebels. So there's this criticism that he didn't pay much attention to the Mindanao issues he should have. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that on one hand, you have the pivot of the Daesh here to Asia. That's not Duterte's fault. And the other thing is that actually Duterte has been trying to resuscitate uh, the deadlock or the, you know, the deadlocked peace negotiations since 2015. Because in 2015, there was an incident whereby the Banks of More Islamic Freedom Fighters, together with some fighters from the More Islamic Liberation Front, were involved in the slaying of 44 special forces from the Philippine National Police. That was called the Mamasapana tragedy. After that January 2015 incident, the Philippine legislature, uh, which is dominated mostly by, you know, Christian uh, you know, representatives, they said, we're not going to give more concession to the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So for almost two years, we have seen a stagnation in the peace process. And the stagnation of that peace process, together with the pivot of Daesh here to Asia, has created the necessary, you know, ingredients for more radical jihadi groups to mobilize support. In fact, I'm quite also worried about Marawi because Marawi is quite devastated. People are comparing it to Mosul or Aleppo. So if the Philippine government doesn't reconstruct and rebuild properly Marawi, right. then there will still be grievances that can be exploited by Maute. Now, what Duterte is trying to do is here is that he's saying, 
We need federalism because under federalism, we can give more political autonomy to moderate Islamist okay. rebel groups like the more Islamic Liberation Front and more National Liberation Front so that eventually we can sideline and marginalize the extremist, extremist jihadi, move, uh, jihadi movements. And that's the best way forward. And I think President Duterte is correct in that. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, for being with us, both of you, Richard Haidarian in Manila and Graham Ong Webb in Singapore. Thanks for being on Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. Remember, you can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, there's our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Sika and the whole team here. Bye for now.